what would be the best method to get you to a more normal range? Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe you're not someone that's totally hypogonadal, but like, you know, low T symptoms, right? Lower T and symptoms. Um, What would, what you're aging, maybe you're an aged, you know, like 50 year old man or something. What would be the ideal delivery method that would really get you those benefits, but lower that risk profile? Yeah. Um, And one thing just to add before we entered that subtopic, I do want to clarify, if somebody was to take an amount of testosterone, even if it put them to like high normal of the reference range, but it was something you tolerated in youth and like your body was capable of handling, which a lot of people are. If you do it responsibly, understand what you're taking, know how to monitor your biomarkers, are lean, healthy, have a good diet, lifestyles dialed in, you're aware of the risks. Um, All that stuff is like overseen with a level of education, some level of rigor, and like obviously decreasing need. Over time, as you start to dial it in, you'll it's not as like rigorous of an oversight process because after you're in your dialed protocol, it's just kind of like living your life and you know what to expect from your blood work at that point and how it affects everything. You'll probably be fine. Probably. It's just being aware. It's not zero risk. Like, it's just like, that's the thing people need to accept if they want to be pushing, you know, to some level that is like, just in general, like it's never going to be risk free. But I could still also say with certainty that if you're hypogonadal, you're going to be healthier replacing to physiologic than you would staying hypogonadal for sure. Like you are a thousand percent in cardiotoxic, neurotoxic, uh, quality of life down the, you know, the toilet territory if you're like in hypogonadal levels, almost certainly. So hopefully that's like somewhat of a consolidated raft because I don't want to like sound too... uh, like it's worth being cautious and aware of all this stuff, but like it's certainly not to don't dissuade yourself out of like fixing your levels too. Like it's critical that you have adequate hormone production, similar to women in menopause. Like the the benefit outweighs the risk. All, like essentially every single time, essentially, and you just have to be responsible about your approach to what that is. Listen. Well, especially if you're you're monitoring biomarkers and we'd lo- I'd love to like talk about some of those in a minute, but yeah. I think that's that's the key too, right? Yeah. Like monitoring, right? Yeah. Okay. So then circling back to administration, like the ideal way to go about it. Um, I can say off the rip, I would not do pellets. I would probably not do androgel if you're a male. If you're a female, it's a bit different, which we can get into. Um, the creams through compounding pharmacies. That's probably the only like tolerable way you're going to have something that you can apply scrotally to get the ideal absorption and pharmacokinetic profile that would be reflective of something that's like more natural. So like that is probably on paper, arguably the best way to go about it. It's just not necessarily something everyone wants to do, but it it works well and it will get you to the levels that are great and look pretty physiologic and like kind of reflect the pulsatile diurnal nature of normal testosterone secretion. And it's also converting like locally, like in the area you would actually be producing it too. Like there is a local effect too through like five alpha reduction in the skin and stuff like that, Um, which can result in, that's why monitoring like DHT and some of this other stuff can be important, but that's like a whole more nuanced discussion. But in general, the cream scrotally, is reliable, good, produces a very favorable outcome, and a lot of guys will be quite happy with that method. The other method that I would say is worth uh, considering, and like the typical one that most guys do, is injection, which it's a bit more predictable, typically, in terms of like what you're going to get out of it. In terms of adherence, it's a lot easier because you don't have to shoot it daily. You can also modulate the release pattern of it through either the ester. So like you'll typically get prescribed like the longest bleed ester. So Cipionate has a half-life of like, I think it's like 10 days or something, maybe eight to 10 days, depending on how, uh, depending on individual biochemistry and how you kind of like cleave the ester. But you can also change the way it absorbs via injecting subcutaneously into stomach fat or into any sub-Q fat versus intramuscularly where it's more quickly going to get absorbed and assimilated. So you can also bleed out the effect even more and make it even more stable in your blood levels. And it's pretty easy to adhere to a TRT protocol of like 
micro injections, even on like a relative frequent basis, like every other day is pretty damn stable. Subcutaneously is what a lot of guys do and works really, really well. And, you know, it keeps a very stable uh, hormone concentration curve. It's pretty predictable and what's going to happen. You just kind of like got to be aware of the, you know, how hard you're pushing it and what that will do to your risk profile accordingly. The other way that's promising that I would say is uh, oral testosterone undecanoate lymphatic absorption patented format. So there is three, I believe, T Talando, um, Jatenzo, and Kaisatrix. And they've basically managed to make a lymphatically absorbed testosterone undecanoate you can actually swallow orally, whereas back in the day, they would have had to make it hepatotoxic to actually make it through the liver um, through a first pass metabolism and actually like make it into circulation to any meaningful level. They'd have to like add like a 17 alpha alkylated group to it and make it like a terrible for you oral steroid, essentially. This does not have the same level of stress. It's not stress free as far as I know. But it's will get you the me a meaningfully significant like get you replacement of total T levels to like mid to high range depending on the person likely achieve symptom relief for guys who are hypogonadal and is pretty sustainable because you're just popping something so some people prefer that pretty expensive though and kind of like a newer medium of administration but promising nonetheless um, typically what guys are doing though still is the injections and the or the cream. And then the other method is intranasal, which I'm sure you've probably heard of for like, you know, hypoactive sexual disorder for women has a potential for that, um, as well as uh, for men as like a different medium of getting like an erythropoiesis uh, stimulating free version of test because it's so acute. It's just like an unsustainable daily treatment, unfortunately. Like it's okay if you're trying to have like an on-demand libido boost as a female or something but for a guy using it like multiple times a day in snorting something it's like not something any guy i think would want to do for and even if they think it's cool to begin with i think for once you get to like the month or couple month mark you the novelty would probably fade um like a lot of guys are you know super excited when they start testosterone injections like it's like this rush you're using like this hormone and it's you know i'm replacing and it's you know it feels like this big significant thing and then you know, year in, it's just like, oh, I got to do my injection. So it's like whatever you can most sustainably adhere to that is like the safest will achieve the outcome you desire. The symptom relief is the one you should stick to. And the cream, I guess I didn't mention the obvious, but like transference. If you have children, you have pets, like there are uh, concerns with, you know, like what you are going to rub it off on and like how like your hygiene with it. So that's worth mentioning because like there are cases of transference issues that have been noted in media you know i think i did a video a while ago where some dad accidentally was like wiping residue on his kid without even realizing it even after he like thought he cleaned it and his kid was like starting to get masculinized from the from the testosterone residue or something wow yeah crazy because it's like the levels are so low like any like significant amount will like push things in like a significant incremental direction that is like gonna cause problems so that's a thing whereas injection it's like you're in the bathroom you do it and it's clean and done totally sterile you don't have to worry about like are my hands fully clean you know is somebody going to get into it like good luck accidentally like breaking into like a multi-dose vial or something like, it's not going to happen so right. yeah there's like different like logistical advantages too to some of these administration methods that probably should not be understated but are worth mentioning um so yeah i think the three most viable cream scrotal application, injection, intramuscular, or sub-Q if you want to bleed out the effect, or maybe the oral, um, all but I want to see more of the literature as it evolves. Right. So it's kind yeah. of a newer thing. And when it comes to the injections, it sounds like more frequent sub-Q is like, subcutaneous is like where you're going to get more, less of the probability of having that supra physiological peak versus mm -hmm. like if you're just doing it once a week intramuscular yeah not bleeding out that like response that or effect um but again it's it, it as you mentioned compliance is definitely going to be better if you're doing it once yeah. a week but i mean twice a week three times like every other day i mean you know for people that are that are really concerned about risk profile perhaps they have already like you know a family history of 
cardiovascular disease or stroke or whatever, they probably are more incentivized to like lower that risk for yeah. any potential side effects. Yeah, like in general, I think or some... fertility. What about oh, men that yeah. are wanting we men talk... men that are wanting to reproduce? Yeah, we gotta talk about that too. But one rule of thumb that's like to make it as easy to understand, at least for me, this was the easiest to understand, like how I remember it is the closer something is to what would be equivalent to what you would naturally make should you have had, should you have healthy functioning testes producing natural testosterone, that's going to be the one that has the least impact on all of the unlike intentional consequences of like spikes in hormones. So like normally on a daily basis, you would pulse out like in ebbs and flows multiple times. So like the more you can get these like the more stable you can get it with the more micro administration spread throughout the week, the more stable everything will be. And as a consequence, less spikes into the territory that would produce things that are not representative of physiologic. And typically daily administration is the way to go, whether it's like cream is going to be twice a day at least, but then for injection, it's like every day and every other day there's diminishing returns, but you can kind of, like we said, bleed it out a bit. So 